Mr. Baxter. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Please do take a seat as we get underway with the first of our panel sessions here at FIDIC 2018. The first panel here is Perspectives from the Boardroom. Uh, we looked at all of the panels across the range of the conference and we looked to answer a certain set of questions within each of the panels. Uh, so this is based around uh, a discussion with the CEOs of consulting engineering firms and C-suite specialists on the future of our consulting businesses in the digital economy. New business models, people and leadership challenges. We posed a few questions to our panellists uh, previously in the, in the months prior to the event and we were looking at things as how will technology impact on our projects and our project delivery? What are the impacts on people and skills required to meet the challenges and those opportunities? How do we see enterprise risk developing in a technology driven environment? These and more questions. But what we would like to do is engage you very much in the same way as Gernot uh, engaged us in his presentation. We're going to pose you a couple of questions here at the beginning of the session. We would like to get your input. So please do grab the uh, smart device. We'll start looking at the app and let us vote now on a few of these uh, ideas. So we have two questions that we would like to get your input on and this will also help our panel here as we uh, go into the next session. So the first of these is this, what do you consider to be the biggest challenge for the industry? We're going to give you a range of answers here. So the first question will be, what do you consider to be the biggest challenge for the industry? You have roughly 30 seconds or so to answer these questions. So the first of these is coming to you now. Once again, we do, uh, if, you, if you don't know uh, how to log in, those are the instructions there. Very briefly, the FIDIC voting, FIDIC 2018. And once you're into the conference app, choose the voting section. So the question here is this one. What do you consider to be the biggest challenge for our industry? There's a range of answers. Lack of skills for industry, consolidation of the market, inadequate investment in infrastructure, political uncertainty, cyber risk, and certainly we've seen a great deal of this, and disruptive technology. <laughs> Fabulous to see the results coming through and people engaging with that. Thank you very much indeed. So we've got the responses there. Uh, once again, we do have only roughly 30 seconds in that time frame. We do have one more question for you, which will come shortly. Um, so I believe we're going to be able to have a look at the uh, results of this very shortly. And I believe if I move this across, we'll look at some results for this particular poll there. So there we go. The two of those are showing very highly lack of skill set for industry and uh, disruptive technology. Move through then to the next question that we have, which is what do you think keeps most industry leaders awake at night? <laughs> what do you think keeps most industry leaders awake at night? We'll give you th three. <laughs> We're going to give you three uh, options to choose from. So I'm assuming this will move through, and here we are. What do you think keeps most industry leaders awake at night? Is it reputational risk? Is it growth or lack of growth in their business? And is it inadequate profitability? Great to see the participation right across there, ladies and gents. Excellent. So let's have a look at those results. What do you think keeps industry, uh, most industry leaders awake at night? And there is the very telling answer right across the board. Almost. Half of our room, 49%, inadequate profitability, looking there. Show me the money, I think is what we're saying. 
Okay, so with those two questions answered, we will now move to our panel. So, ladies and gents, we have an esteemed panel here. Um, I'm going to welcome our CEO to join us here at the podium, and we shall get ourselves underway over the space of the next uh, roughly 70 or 80 minutes. We will uh, try and answer a few of uh, the questions that we will pose to our panel in the initial start of our uh, conference design. So, ladies and gents, without any further ado, let us get ourselves underway. Please do put your hands together once again for our CEO as he joins us here at the podium. Nelson Ogoshegan. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, it's amazing when you ask the question, um, which are quite fundamental. Um, I'm told that we've got nearly 600 people here. So actually, this is a very good statistic in terms of geographical diversification and the feedback that is coming from the industry. I'm really, really intrigued to know that those two big points skills and profitability, either for higher or lower profitability. Those are the two things that keeps the big CEO of concern. Um, for those who came to the conference last year in Jakarta, I was privileged to do the closing run. Uh, I never knew I'm going to be responsible in the following year, but you know what they say, be careful what you wish for. When you get it, it may be of a challenge. Um, this particular morning, I'm doing the reverse of last year, where we had CEO closing out. I'm doing the CEO to start up the program. And it was incredible to listen to McKinsey earlier on giving us what I describe as helicopter view of the issues that drives our industry. And if I remember precisely, if I can do a quick, you know, uphead, I did show some photographs last year, which I felt was quite important in terms of what I consider to be market drivers. Um, in the presentation that was given by our colleague from McKinsey, it was very much focused on big elephant, you know, ele you know, massive, massive issue. But I tend to bring it back down to the reality of things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So on one hand, we have the economy, which we have to deal with, whether we like it or not. On the other hand, you have the issue to do with China, which is a formidable force. We all have to recognize that. The subject of merger and acquisition and consolidation of the industry often spoken about. Sometimes we want to dive, sometimes we don't want to dive. Depends on where you are. Urbanization, more and more people living in the city, which is a concern for us and for our business. How do we look at our infrastructure? How do we deal with the issue that is facing our industry? These are big issues that our CEO have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, either in their geographical area, in the national area, or on the global area. One of the things we never talk about is the issue about politics. And politics is actually quite important in everything we do. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, whether you are in the emerging market or advanced market or just mid cruising market, politics is absolutely imperative. <clears throat> I've shown some photographs there just to give you some sight. Some of the people who are shaking the wall, if I can call it that way, trying to give us an impression. On top of that, for those who are in Europe, we have this unexpected issue of our Brexit. What does it mean for the rest of the world? It's not just about Europe, it's a global issue. To me, those are the things I consider to be a big issue which our friend from McKinsey touched on briefly by talking about regulations. I think that was the key word he talks about. Regulations will impact our industry. We need to get better regulations. <coughs> if we don't understand all these big drivers, it's very difficult to formulate the right regulation. And unless we have that right regulation, it's very, very difficult to have a sustainable business environment. One of the subjects he talks about, which is about technology and which is the theme of today, and that is where our panel speaker is going to dwell on, and that, that's the task is being given to them. I'm not going to go through some of the images there, but they're self-explanatory. Big data. We're going to hear later on from our technology specialists how that's going to impact us. But the subject matter is there. It's the big elephant in the room. What does it mean? It's going to change the business model that we traditionally run for so many years. Is our business model of the issue of selling hourly rate the business model for the future? I hear from the chair from McKinsey talking about collaborative industry, front-end design, off-site manufacturing. These are the big issues that he's addressing that we need to deal with. 
I thought without spending too much time, it would be a good idea to put a question to the audience. Um, how I'm going to play it is very simple. Those are the questions that the delegates, sorry, the speakers have been tasked. Uh, and I look across, I'm not going to spend too much time because I'm being told, Greg, that the CV of this eminent individual panel are very much available in the apps. Uh, but I will mention their name just so that you know who is who. Uh, on the far end, you've got David Reid from Jacobs, uh, followed by Keith Howell, who is from Mott McDonald, Axia from Sweco, and I've got Laura sitting from AECON, and also Manish from Ashley. Now, they are slightly different business from different geographical area, and they have different perspective of the issues that we want to talk about. The task I've asked them to do is to take the subject and the question that's been posed to them, and I've genuinely looked at the key point, market technology people enterprise risk. In the survey that we've just done, two points came out. People, resources is critical. And secondly, you have to run a business that is profitable. It doesn't matter what it is, you have to run a business that's profitable. The speaker we have are very much along the line. And my brief to them is take it any way you like what I want to do is to give each speaker opportunity for five, maximum 10 minutes. And Greg is going to be on the button if we exceed that time. <coughs> and we'll have an opportunity from each speaker to you know, share their perspective on this subject. Then we move into what I call a sort of a question and answer session. In my usual way, I would like to give it a kickstart and I've got a question for each of the speakers. But I want to prime you in advance to think about challenging questions for these eminent speakers because they're ready to answer your question, I'm told. Is that correct? I think to some extent it's absolutely correct. Uh, so please, I would like to have an interactive session. Last year, one of the criticisms we had was this was quite important to bring this CEO together, but we did not give them enough time for the audience to get engaged with them. So I take that back. And this year, we're going to have an improvement. We have one hour and a half to spend with the CEO. Um, but one thing I also want to put a comment on, last year, as good thing in the usual work of FIDIC, we had some feedback about things we could do better. And since the theme for this day uh, is about smart technology and infrastructure, so I'm really pleased that we have a, what I call you know, Twitter feed going through, opportunity for question and answer, opportunity for you to understand what it's doing. Whilst we've got 600 people <coughs> plus, I'm really pleased that other people who are not here can actually get to understand what is being debated wherever they are through the live feed. So on that note, I'm going to ask Axel if you want to take the floor uh, and present your view on the subject. Thank you very much, Axel. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm the CEO of Sveco. Um, we are a consultancy service in the, in the fields of architecture, engineering, and, and environmental services. Uh, we are established in Europe. Uh, our main country is in, the, is in the northern Europe. And we do project export uh, in 70 countries all over Europe. We have 15,000 employees um, in our company. It's a pleasure to be here and meet all of you important uh, colleagues from the Build Society from all over the world. It's also an honor to uh, get the opportunity to contribute um, at this conference. I see three challenges that, we, that, that is crucial for this industry, but also for the wider society to handle. And on the question what makes me lose sleep is actually part of those challenges. Um, first, uh, as we talked about here before, is the increasing rate of change in the technology shift. Our technology and knowledge uh, is becoming more and more complex. It requires increasingly faster adaptation from all of us, not only this industry, also our cost, uh, all the consumers and the politicians in the world. Some may not be able to keep up the pace uh, of change. Thank you. 
uh, some will not be able to keep up uh, the pace of change. And I also think that um, change goes so fast, and we're talking about really new technology going into the, f the future as uh, artificial intelligence, and in the end, super intelligence that we don't know much about um, so far. Um, and unless we are careful, it may create moral dilemmas, social conflicts, and ultimately a stagnating development. The technology change must be handled in a constructive, democratic, and ethical way. The second thing is the climate and environmental change. It will be crucial for the future in general. Unless we all start to more seriously deal with the challenge, we will not have any industry, society, any world. There is an uh, impressive shift um, taking place. The industry is becoming the driver of this change. Well, it used to be the politicians and the consumer pushing us. I not only urge this industry to maintain a leader in the climate field, I think we must wrap it up our efforts point out the possibilities to inspire discussions, to lead by examples, work even faster and more serious to use our knowledge and initiative to tackle the climate change. Here we can leverage from the increasing speed of technology shift. Thirdly, that we have the human competence available to handle the challenges that we're facing and are able to utilize the full uh, potential ahead. By far, Sveco's greatest challenge right now is the skill shortage in the Nordic and in the European labor markets. There are not enough engineers and architects to meet the rapidly growth, uh, growing demand and not enough, um, are, be not enough are being trained. This hampers growth potential. And this is not, uh, this is not only happened in a few labor markets in the, North, in the European countries. It's a lack of engineers in fairly all markets. This is a pan-European challenge, um, and a challenge that the European industry, politician, and education system will have to work with. Maybe even the parents in Europe need to work with this. The society must find ways to attract more talents into uh, engineering and design. We must work for it as employees to create a more exciting and uh, attractive opportunities. It's really hard for a single company to, to handle all this change uh, and those three challenges by, by ourselves. It rather requires political unity on national level, European level, and global level. It may sound like a paradox, um, but the same challenges that keep me awake at night um, also give me an optimistic view of the future. The increasing speed of technology will require um, expertise. Our customers need to focus more on their core, core business, which means they need expertise and consultancy service from all over. Focusing on climate means investments in infrastructure uh, in, in all countries in the world. The climate effort will also require substantially investments. Um, we will be able to present and use new technology to meet demands from industry, lawmakers, consumers, and this will actually mean opportunities for all of us. 
I also think that the combination of human and machine learning will efficiently address the shortest of necessary competence. We are working uh, every day to ensure that we get the right skills and the competences into our company. We have built up a capability of recruiting young talents um, in all our countries. Last year we recruited around 2,400 um, engineers and architects in our European countries. One fourth of them were new graduated uh, young engineers and architects. We need to capture the best talent. We have a thorough process, but that is not enough. So we need also to capture the opportunities with technology, machine intelligence to address the shortage. And again, this is an opportunity that the technology shift is really offering us. So all in all, I'm an optimist, um, so we will make this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation because Nelson suggested just to come here and share some thoughts. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I have plenty of thoughts. I, the topic is so broad and it's so different and diverse that we could talk on any one particular topic. So I, I thought of it and I said, when I go into the board meetings, what do we normally start with? We always feel it's an opportunity at the board meetings to reflect on who we are, what we are, and assess where we may have opportunities to improve. But also take a moment to celebrate the success that we've had and how we can get better. One of the challenges at the board is to avoid looking at short-term plans. As a CEO, I can tell you it's a very challenging to be a CEO. Because around the world, the economies are in a slow growth. As we saw from our own survey, profitability is of great importance and it is, it's declining. The political uncertainties is not helping either. And the technical disruptors are quite a few and, and coming out of the woodworks. But we also have other challenges to be stewards, to be good environment, social, governance, uh, diversity, inclusiveness, that we should continue to challenge ourselves for. So what is it that keeps me awake? I think it's the volatility of things. Uh, but then I also tell myself there's not much I can do about it, so I sleep well. <laughs> the geopolitical has a direct impact on our work, be it Brexit, be it NAFTA, EPPs, but more, more uh, relevant is motivating people and generating a sense of spirit within an organization. Something that employees feel that they are relevant and that they are heard and that they, they get more passionate about things. Empowering them for them to be, have a sense of purpose to make sure that it's not just funny titles you give them, but you hold them accountable for what they want to do. And of course, changing culture. I'm a big believer it's your culture that defines you, but I also feel that one needs to adapt to the changing dynamics of the world. So one must continue to change. Trend is always your friend. Growth is shifting types of services are shifting. The payments models are shifting. Payment for value is what we should ask for. Local capabilities within a global footprint is not a luxury of few large firms. It has to be for everybody in this global economy. And I think we need to continue to work by developing more cooperation among our firms with local partners and maintaining that we are 
we are prepared for the unknown. I think on technology, I, I didn't want to repeat what was said earlier, but what I feel is, is, is all about predicting. It's all about whether something new will replace something that we are currently doing, and if so, when will it be, or what will it be? And unless we understand the ecosystem in which our technology uh, works, then it, it will not be successful. I think the strength of maturity of the elements that define the ecosystem of technology is a key to understand. It's the services, the standards, the clients, the codes, the regulations that we live in. And as Asa said, technology revolution has seen an unprecedented rate of change. And there's a paradigm shift required to reinvent ourselves, to transform, to embrace the new markets, the new models, and to try new experiences. I don't think it'll be easy, but I think we should embark upon it. On artificial intelligence, Nelson said, say a few words. And I always like this definition by Professor Agarwal at University of Toronto. He said, artificial intelligence serves a single but potentially transformative, pur transformative purpose, which is the economic purpose. It's significant lowers the cost of prediction. We all want to know what do we need to do and when in order to be able to be effective about it. Doing good is good business, especially if you're in business for the long term. These are words of John Brown from BP. And I think it's important and applies across all industries around the world. We have to think, what do we do in the broadest possible way? I was talking to Mandana yesterday and this morning, and I understand at YP program also the diversity and inclusiveness which is important for everybody. I personally feel it should be the other way around. It should be inclusiveness and diversity. Because everyone matters. Each one of us has something unique to offer, something unique to give, and everyone should be included. We come with diverse cultures, diverse background, di diverse way of seeing, our thinking, and we, we need to support, accept, and respect. I think it's the behavioral change in our industry and in our employees. We have to be open to understand others, we have to ask, we have to listen, we have to learn, we have to accept and respect. I think we are an open and inclusive workplace, which will then be dynamic and robust and prepare you for what lies ahead. He asked me to talk a little bit about China. I think China is an, is an economic power that generates geopolitical power. But I think they have their own challenges. The global infrastructure needs are so huge that I think we should not fight them but let them spend as much as they want, as long as that it's in the context of the global framework. China's growth rate has, begun to, has started to taper down, and in spite of substantial institutional changes that they've already undertaken, they'll need to continue to make investments to, to go from investment model to a productive model. Technological advances will change our resource equation. When do we invest and what, what do we do? I can go on and on and on, but I would like to end with a thought from Leonardo da Vinci. I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be here this morning. And I must say, Nelson has given us slightly different instructions for each of us, but 
that's the, the diversity of the panel, isn't it? So um, I'm sure it'll make for some rich question and answer time. My name's Lara Poloni. I'm the Chief Executive for ACOM for our EMEA operations, and it's a very diverse region, as you can appreciate. So it encompasses a, um, a region that extends from Moscow in the north, uh, as far south as um, South Africa, and then over, it also includes India um, as well, and then obviously our continental Europe and UK operations, and the Middle East, which is a, a fascinating time to be in the role, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia, where there is just so, such huge um, social and cultural transformation, which brings a different sort of perspective to some of the questions that Nelson has asked us to look at today. On to the markets first, though. Um, a, a firm like, and I'm, I'm answering most of these questions from um, our boardroom perspective, and like many of my fellow panellists, we have been on quite a journey over the last decade in terms of very rapid acquisitive growth and a, a change in strategy along the way, but what is at the heart of most of our organisations is a very deep and rich consulting engineering foundation, which we certainly don't want to lose um, amidst all of the other sort of plays into other market adjacencies and different regions and different risk profiles. But where we are at at the moment is we have certainly seen in ACOM over the last couple of years an opportunity to extend from that deep um, consulting engineering and, and environmental science um, and, and quantity cost estimating, etc through to stepping up and taking a bit more um, risk through some of the acquisitions, such as the um, Tishman acquisition in New York City, which is where they build vertical high-rise. So for us, that has raised many questions around, as engineers, how far do we want to extend along the design, build, finance, operate and maintain continuum? Which I can tell you um, creates some very interesting discussions in our boardroom in terms of the risk appetite that we want to take uh, forward into our future strategies. But one thing is clear, uh, in that um, you know, pivot across the project life cycle, there is a tremendous opportunity for engineers to play a role. Because you can imagine, we've probably felt a bit suppressed just doing standard design work when we have engineers who can certainly contribute a great point of view yeah, particularly in this digital age in terms of the operations and, and maintenance phases of many of these projects. So I think the one word of caution I would say though is that organisations such as ours, you, we have to make sure that we are continuing to invest in the specific skill sets that don't extend beyond our sort of natural area. So for example, the whole, quest, the whole adjacency be between design and build means that you need to have people in your organisation who have actually built things and constructed things and understand how to bring to des design into the construction phase of projects. And it is indeed that very skill set of project delivery and constructability, if we look across all of our markets, whether they're in Australia or the UK or um, elsewhere in Europe at the moment that we as an industry are falling short in terms of you know, those sorts of skill sets. So it makes for a very rich conversation. My next point I think is one around partnerships and for many years certainly um, you know sometimes this is people don't want to talk about partnerships because it implies notions of competition but I'm a firm believer that strategic partnerships are the way of the future in order to address the you know the the trillions of dollar deficit that we have in um, infrastructure around the world and not just that it, it just it, as an industry makes us a whole lot richer. So there are a lot of emerging partnerships that I see and some of them, yes, will have some interesting questions of competition and adjacencies and we have questions to answer about how far we want to um, extend or bring those partnerships together. But I think it's a great opportunity at the moment to look at our traditional um, engineering partnerships. The scale of so many of these projects means that a singular firm, despite all of its amazing capabilities and global platform, can't often bring the skill sets in the time that our clients require to deliver these projects. There are some interesting partnerships, I think, um, that we're certainly looking at with other technology, the, the Googles and a Amazons of the world, um, whether it's for a smart city project or for uh, looking at, again, an infrastructure asset all the way through the project life cycle and introducing um, smart cars, all those things that are upon us now. So 
again, we can't, as a consulting engineering industry, answer all of those questions on our own. And of course, there are the great management consultancies like McKinsey, who provide often a very interesting strategic lens and a transformational lens to what we're doing. And I always say to our teams that we can't lose the fact that we bring, we're content rich and subject matter rich in terms of the um, innovation, particularly from an engineering perspective that we bring to some of those partnerships. So I think partnerships and also with construction firms, I would say, and that's a, a rapidly changing space just like ours is, uh, are critical for the future. There's certainly been so much globalization um, we've seen it in terms of um, not just the Chinese, as, as Nelson alluded to, but certainly when I was in Australia, we saw the advent of a lot of the Spanish contractors and Italian contractors that were coming to town. So I think that's now levelled, but that's a, that's a fact of life as well, that in, for most of the big infrastructure projects, there are increase, increasingly international fields of consultants and contractors coming to play. And so the challenge, as we're hearing from our clients, remains how do you make sure that you have that you know, great local content as well as bringing the best global know-how. So again, I think that's another key market trend that is, that is here to stay. And Global Design Centres, finally, a very controversial one sometimes, but having been to visit one of our design centres recently in Delhi, I can't tell you I was absolutely um, blown over by just the deep um, expertise and how impressive some of the young engineering graduates in a market like India are. I mean, often double degrees, sometimes three degrees, um, very highly educated, enthusiastic, passionate. So it's not just because of the cost arbitrage, but it's also, I think, just a, a fantastic way to um, make sure that we are fielding, you know, a truly global f um, team to many of the projects that we deliver. I won't dwell on this next slide, but basically I think you know this is obviously a key theme for the, the conference and we've had some great um, discussions so far, but I, th I think it is all about integration and many of us working in the field already know just how transformative bringing some of these applications to our projects, even at a basic community level, have been. So gone are the days when many of us used to turn up to public consultation for um, schemes um, for our projects and had to stand at the board, you know, pointing at a very complex design drawing that no one could understand with all the changes laid out. Now we have the community putting on their goggles and immersing themselves into a virtual reality environment. Um, I think that's that's just um, you know that, that that adoption is is very widespread now, but it, more broadly, there are certainly some implications for procurement, um, for making sure that all parts of the supply chain across that design, build, finance, and and operate and maintain phase are brought together. So tremendous opportunity here, and it is so, so fast moving. I think, and firms such as ours, I mean, f five or six years ago, we didn't have a chief digital officer, but now most of our operations do have that, and. And they work hand in glove with our, you know, engineering fraternity to um, to work through those approaches. Political climate. How are we going for time? A couple of minutes. But um, again, this is one Nelson where we could talk for hours and hours. And I have one of my Australian colleagues here, um, Megan Motto, who many of you know. And I was lamenting um, having lived in the UK for the past year and just the challenges and the day to day just heaviness of that the conversation of, of Brexit and she reminded me that, um, you know, we used to talk about the, the dilemmas in terms of getting infrastructure projects off the ground and the problems associated with single term governments and what that means for a, a sustainable pipeline and she reminded me that given recent events in Australia you can't even bank on a single term, it's half a term or a quarter of a term. So um, look, I think whether it's in the US, although we are, we are seeing certainly in the US that there is now a stronger pipeline for the first time in many years of infrastructure projects given some of the legislative changes that have occurred there. Um, Europe, I think, just remains you know, complex and, and places like uh, India are going to the polls again, which means that um, for six months things will go into a bit of an embargo position. But what I say when we have to sort of communicate this to our um, headquarters in, in Los Angeles is that we now have to accept that this is the new normal. There will always be now these political fluctuations. We have seen the um, sovereign risk implications of some of these changes on the projects that we believe we are contracted for, but then that can change overnight as well. So 
we have some expertise and um, some, you know, this is one of the, the, the again, key states of, of new normal that we just have to um, come to terms with. And of course, there will always be very um, long-standing areas of political instability and conflict um, that many of us are aware of as well that um, we factor into our, our operations. Above all of that, though, um, I, I'm a big believer that you know, obviously that can unsettle our team sometimes, so it's paramount that we're constantly talking and acknowledging some of these challenges and there's no substitute for face time to do that. But as leaders, most of us I think on the panel have also got used to the fact that um, we've had to up our social media presence as well and, um, and get with the, the program there. So finally, um, on people, um, I think flexibility, a big topic on my agenda at the moment, and there, yes, there are still those perceptions in the industry that people need to see you and be present, but we do need to continue to move the conversation to one of outcomes enabled by technology if we truly want to make sure that we are bringing the best workforce to our sector and to the projects that require that expertise. Um, and health and wellbeing. There's a, you know, we're, I think, raising the level of awareness about the mental strain and concern around that. We have, you know, lots of great conversations around health and safety, but I think a particular focus on uh, health, on mental health sometimes is, is missing as well. So they're the key points from me. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Keith Howes. I'm chairman of Mott McDonald, have been for the last uh, eight years, I think, and um, I decided to ignore Nelson's instructions and, uh, and um, just talk about the subject. So uh, my slides are here as uh, memory joggers for me, principally. It's, I'm getting a bit on a bit now. My memory's starting to fail, so it's better that I have a few pointers on the screen to keep me going. Um, a quick info commercial about uh, Mott McDonald. We're a UK registered but uh, fairly globally uh, uh, spread company. We have about 16,000 people uh, around the world. We're employee owned which I think drives a particular culture amongst those of you who are also in employee owned uh, businesses, you'll know what I mean. We do all the usual stuff, planning, feasibility, design, project management, uh, uh, all the rest of it. Um, do quite a lot of IFI work and we have some specialisms in that in things like uh, health and education and uh, governance and so on. Um, and uh, we also uh, own a medium-sized contractor in the UK, which I think is quite interesting because there's not many consultants who own contractors. It's normally the other way around. But it gives us some quite interesting insight into the construction end of our business. And it uh, also um, allows us to uh, play a little bit, gives us an opportunity for a bit of innovation uh, in the in the construction space as well as in the uh, design space. Um, we have a global design center, uh, two in fact, one in India, one in Europe, which uh, are not there necessarily for costs, but they're there about resource and skills, and we put a lot of investment into them to uh, actually develop them, the, give them the technology to do the job, but also to, to train them to do it the way we want to do it. Uh, so that's enough about that, and I'll now move on hopefully, to talk. So these, these were the exam questions uh, that we were asked, and I'm going to touch on three of them, because uh, I think number two is, uh, is, is a bit of a, a given, really. It, it's bound to grow with a growing population and rising uh, living standards and all the rest of it, and the only constraints that I see are <coughs> and financial. And I'm not going to talk about risk, but um, let's start with the first point. So is it about technology? I'm not sure it is. I think it's about information. And the technology is an enabler. So it's allowing us to do things, to collect information and to do things with information that we've never done before. And the technology will change. It will come and go. It will become obsolete as we've seen over the years. The key thing is the information, which remains the same and remains what drives it. And, and we're an information industry, essentially. I mean, we use our knowledge to add value to the data that the clients supply us with to help them meet their user requirements. And uh, that's what we do as a business. We use our knowledge to add value to their data. And there's no doubt our clients are seeing their businesses changing as well. And that will drive the market for our services. 
And what we're seeing is that capital projects are becoming much more outcome focused. People are thinking more about the social, the economic outcomes than they are about the project. So when we talk to Crossrail, they don't say we've built 50 miles of railway. They say we've improved the service between A and B, which is going to be this much faster, it's going to take that many more people. So I think we've all got our heads, got our, got our heads around not the project, but what are the outcomes and how do we deliver those outcomes. And for me, you know, looking forward, I mean, you know, the good old input-based uh, business model is not going to work when automation, artificial intelligence and so on are delivering in minutes what used to take weeks. So how do we involve our business models to reflect the value that we're creating? Uh, and I think that's a real challenge for, for this industry as a whole because uh, we're already seeing examples of machine learning on um, uh, coastal models and things like that which are running in seconds what used to take a month of computing power to, to run. And you know, when you're in that situation, it's very hard to know where this all stops and, and what it all means. Improving process, getting process standard and so on is, is going to be a key to how we make this industry more efficient. And if we don't solve the value proposition, then we're all in a race to the bottom. We heard about profitability and margins and so on. If we don't solve that value proposition, then I think we are in a race to the, to the bottom. We're giving all the value, I think, as the McKinsey speaker said, back to our, back to our customers. So how is it going to improve? How will technology, was the question, impact our projects and project delivery? And I come back to the point about information. So something like 99% of our assets are already built. And we can get more value out of them. How do we release the value through using information and data? And we've all, we all know about common data environments with you know, BIM and GIS as the foundation from concept. I don't know we've got that many through to completion yet, but in time, they're going to give us the platform, really, that we can use to, um, to drive and release that, uh, that value. And uh, what does it mean for us? I, I think we are going to spend more time on planning and thinking about our projects. Stakeholder engagement, coming back to the outcomes point, we're seeing more and more stakeholder engagement. Um, you look at the projects like High Speed 2 and in the planning parliamentary approval phase, there's a lot more input on environmental, social, land issues than there is on engineering. Probably three to one, in truth, uh, of the effort is going on those issues rather than the engineering. And, um, and I, th I think it will lead us to make better decisions because we'll be using the big data, we'll be using the feedback from social media to improve the decision making around those project concepts. And uh, while project design and documentation will absolutely, no doubt, become more efficient, um, but you've then got the issue about technical governance, because it's very easy to sit at a screen and string a few things together using digital component catalogues or, or, or whatever to, you know, I've seen graduates putting bridge designs together in an hour and a half, you know, and I talk to some of my colleagues with 30 years of experience and say, well, how long would that have taken you 30 years ago? And they say, oh, at least a month, you know. So, um, but, but we've got to make sure it stands up. And so working out how we're going to govern this process is really important. Uh, and we're putting a lot of effort into making sure that our technical governance is sound because we don't want bridges falling down, as we've seen in uh, recent cases in the U.S. and uh, I suppose, uh, Genoa to some extent. Um, now, project delivery will be enhanced by uh, information, but it does need behavioral change across the supply chain. We can't go on in this adversarial approach that we've, if we're going to drive these efficiencies, we've got to break away from that. And that means that when we're sharing information, we can't be protective about it. We really do have to share it. And um, it does need the supply chain to change its behaviors. But the prize, at the end of the day, will be better asset management because that will be driven by that information that we collect during the design, the manufacture, the construction, the installation, commissioning, as well as ongoing performance and monitoring. And that should allow us to get more from less. <coughs> and uh, what does it mean for our people and skills? So I think some people need to become much more digitally focused. I think others need to become more people-focused. We need people who can manage delivery teams, manage stakeholders, understand those outcomes that clients and society want and work out how best to deliver them. And then we've got the 
techie people, if you like, who are driving this new efficient uh, uh, processes that will deliver things that much faster and that much uh, more effectively. So I, I perceive for our business we will be have more consultancy but less engineering design in terms of the mix of our people um, because the engineering design will be process driven, will become more automated. And I think the leadership challenge that we face is in reacting to that pace of change. You know, recognizing what's truly innovative and of real value because sometimes we knee jerk to things. We, we talk to a lot of partners in the tech world and they're all coming up with bright ideas but you've got to put them through a filter and say well is this real? Is it going to make a difference? Is it more widely applicable? Can we get real value out of it? Because a lot of them are, are very gimmicky. Um, we need to understand our clients' drivers, which are changing, and the societal expectations. We're going to have to rechip some employees. We're going to have to get them thinking in a different way, doing different things. And we do have a lot of resistance to change to, uh, to overcome as we go forward. So uh, there in, um, oh, nearly 10 minutes uh, is my perception. So happy to take the questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Keith. Well, good morning, uh, and I am delighted to be here this morning. I'm David Reed. I'm head of sales for Buildings and Infrastructure Europe as part of Jacobs. Uh, and as the, the last speaker, I, I asked my fellow speakers if they could leave me anything new to say. Uh, so I'll try my best to find one or two. And I have to say, lots of what we've heard, I would resonate with myself around partnerships, around <coughs> technology, around transactional behaviour, uh, and how we bring value to our industry. So one or two things that I, I would bring up around the market drivers. A comment I heard lately was that the rate of change will never again be so slow, which is an interesting comment. We, we live at a, in a time when there are lots of transactional markets and when you look to the, what keeps us awake at night around profitability and growth, then they, they certainly do. And, and we've seen the impact of transactional behaviour in many of our sectors and one or two of our, our colleagues, if you like, in the sector have, have unfortunately packed up and died. So how do we address that? Well, that, that's up to us to embrace technology, to embrace change, to embrace disruption. And I have to say one of our great challenges is exactly that. We had a, a session only last week where one of, our, uh, one of my colleagues came up with five different names from Jacobs who are fairly new to the company. I won't give you the names, but they're all very different. Disruptors, people who understand digital, people who are very different thinkers. And he asked the, the room, what did they all have in common? What they had in common is we have really struggled to adopt them into your organisation because they're different. And they're making us think differently. And they're making us think differently in, in an industry which, let's be honest, if you, if you look at the, the McKinsey work, you know, we struggle with change. We struggle to adopt some of these disruptive influences. And I think that's a major challenge, certainly, for all of us in the panel. The other market drivers, though, I, I do see is around... One of the biggest ones I've found is about age. I, and... Uh, we spoke about inclusion and diversity earlier on, and, and this might be a controversial statement. <clears throat> but I'm 52, and I know that will surprise you. You probably thought I was a lot younger. <laughs> so I'm 52, but I, I go to many conferences and uh, strategic sessions where, quite frankly, the age range struggle with technology, struggle with the potential of it. I try my best. I've got an 18-year-old son who helps me out. Right? The fact is, not many of the younger generation at the moment are in positions of influence, are in positions with their clients where they can take decisions, 
But I can assure you, when I look at our youngsters coming through, and I'm sure I speak for all of us here, we've got some fantastic young talent coming through. Once they all get to the position of influence with their clients and with themselves, then we will really see an uptick in the rate of change because they really get the power of technology, as Keith said, as an enabler. So that, is, that will have a big influence. I think another area for us will be around the need, certainly for a company like ourselves, to move away from the thought that every solution will result in a concrete and steel outcome. And so as we sit in front of our clients, our clients now have to demand that we bring the absolute best solutions to bear, as opposed to thinking about how this may turn into a project, because concrete and steel cannot be the future. With connectivity being so high on the agenda for all of us, whether that be locally, whether that be globally, then that connectivity cannot, in my view, be assured by infrastructure. Infrastructure will play a massive part without doubt. Our governments, our clients do not have enough money to build all of the infrastructure at the moment would be on their list of wishes. So our job, I believe, as an industry is to find some really neat, smart solutions that will take the data that we have, the outcomes that we desire, and deliver very, very different solutions of the future, which might be an amalgam of technology, of operations, of maintenance, and concrete and steel in the right places. So I think we need to challenge ourselves to change our mindset and how we adopt and embrace technology to the point where it allows our clients to achieve their outcomes. When we look at new business models, uh, Lara spoke about partnerships. I, th I think partnership uh, will come in many forms. Uh, we also spoke about global consolidation in the market. Uh, there's some very big companies out there. We, we are one of them and others sit here in the panel. But how we work together, I think, is something we absolutely have to achieve if we are to help our clients in particular achieve what they want to achieve. And, and part of that will be, I think, we might call it the death of the billable hour. Right? So much of uh, my company is driven by the billable hour. How many hours do we work and what do we bill? That has to change. It has to change in a way that we put more skin in the game. And much more of the outcomes that we would hope for will be driven by our performance in a partnership with clients, in a partnership with fellow colleagues, but in a way that we are outcome driven as opposed to input driven. The other uh, issue we bring up with technology is around global resources. As I already mentioned, the, the dearth of talent in some parts of the world. But the fact is, when we look across the world, we have a mass of talent. It doesn't always happen to be, if you might say, at the moment, in the right place. Well, I think that just has to change. As I mentioned, that might be controversial, but I think it's absolutely essential. So that's about us using talent in a very different way. I, I have been going through a, a series of discussions with my younger colleagues around the world about the winds of change. The two or three things that they said around our people. So our younger colleagues now say... I might not own a car. I might not purchase a house. But what I do know is I also don't have to be face to face with everybody I work with. I've grown up in an age where on the PlayStation and whichever else I communicate in a very different way, a way I'm very comfortable with. So instead of moving the work or moving the people to the work, I think we'll have to think much more about how we move the work to the people. We all have design centres most of them were born out of cost efficiency, but I think, as Keith said now, they're actually born out of capability, rich capability, and our ability to apply them to the world stage, I think, is very important. I mentioned transactional behaviour earlier. The, the water industry in the UK, for example, I would say is very transactional, low margin. It's been driven to the bottom. But at the same time, we've got a market in Australia which really does need, I think, the capabilities of the rest of the world. It's not in a transactional position. 
So as a company, should we be thinking about how we take you know, this capability in the UK over here, which is fantastic, and apply it to somewhere else in the world? Well, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? It's also about giving people the opportunity to grow and to use these technologies to achieve a different outcome. The other thing I'll say before I close up will be about the companies that the future talent wants to work for and with. I think Sweco, for example, do a great job of being out there with the environmental view and, and thinking about our planet. Right, I'm not an environmentalist per se, but I can assure you that the future talent is very concerned, I believe, about the type of nature of companies they want to work for. Companies who do think about sustainability, companies who do leave a legacy, companies who do think differently about the impact on our planet. It's a very real issue uh, with the talent coming through. I think we all have a duty to use technology to help that. And when we speak about big data, I think that the big data discussion will be about how we help our clients use that, as Keith said, to translate that into the solutions of the future. I think our talent coming through understands that fully. And how we apply that to great solutions going forward, I think we need to release some of that, that talent on a global stage to use technology to deliver fantastic outcomes and really impact those productivity figures that McKinsey mentioned earlier on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Right. I think you've had uh, five CEO or at least board members in whatever capacity they've been in. And I just want to open the floor uh, in terms of question. But before I do that, I suspect some of you are bursting for questions. Uh, Greg, do I take it that you are fairly ready for questions to come from the floor? Good. Excellent. I'm going to start with David. You, you, you probably give it the impression you, you, you've had all these stories and there's a lot of common threads coming through there. I just want to pick up some of the two points you raised, which I think is quite fundamental. You, you talked about if you need to innovate, you have to think differently, which is quite fundamental. Uh, and, and you raised the issue um, about clients are open to different model of compensation. How strongly are clients, do we think the clients in the industry are open to the idea of non-billable strategy as a means of you know, actually delivering value for money? This big debate about value for money is coming up. Uh, and I've had the word that you know, billable time is something in the past, but it's what we have now. How reactive and responsive are clients to that idea of doing non-billable time but actually delivering end service that really give you some upside in the whole project? Uh, if, if I'm being honest, we have a, a real mixed bag. Uh, I, I think a lot of our government clients struggle with that concept. If, if I'm being really frank, I, th I think part of the productivity challenge in the UK, if I mention UK first, is we are gummed up by procurement. Uh, I think we lack a bit of foresight in terms of the outcomes we'd like to achieve. Our private clients are very different. Many of our private clients are, are, are more than happy to discuss uh, different ways of, of building the, the outcomes to our if you like, compensation reward, whatever you might call it. Uh, it's interesting also that Lara's company is now, uh, appears to be very much involved in PPP. And, and making investments in some of these projects. I think the Heathrow project is one, uh, which I think we will all have to think about and being part of actually skinning the game. And I think given the lack of finance at the moment, then I definitely think different partnerships around finance, around our investment, about uh, clients skinning the game is going to change that picture. Well, when I say the death of the billable hour, I believe that will be a, maybe a long, slow, painful death. It's definitely not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but I do see much more transactional behaviour around the billable hour. And we all, to an extent, cut each other's throats in the race to the bottom. Seldom comes out with good outputs. So there's much more discussion around those sorts of models at the moment than I've seen in a long time. 
Max, you, you seem to be you know, doing <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. But, but still, as, uh, as McKinsey started out, uh, this, this industry is quite conservative, uh, and it goes for all of us. So I would argue that, uh, that, of course, the trend that you describe is there. But it's also so that um, we're quite stuck in our, in our old behavior. Um, the, on the customer side, uh, the procurement, the way of procurement and the way we behave and our capability to really, you know, describe the value of what we're doing. Um, so this is also part of, I think, why it goes slow into the new models of, of uh, um, how to price and to... Keith, in your presentation, I think you touched on the idea that, yes, you are a traditional consulting firm, but you now have uh, a contracting arm. And I suspect that actually evolved from partnership agenda to address a specific client sector, because that's the way the procurement process has gone through. That's, that's quite correct. And um, I mean, I think it's been very interesting just touching on the subject here, because uh, you know, it was, it was born out of the privatization of the UK water industry as much as anything. And this push for the clients to have really integrated delivery teams who could do anything from, you know, the uh, you know, early on, early days approvals right through to commissioning and in some cases operation for a while. Um, but what's been interesting there in terms of the, you know, the death of the hours model is the pain and gain mechanisms. So, you know, by having targets effectively and giving you the challenge of beating them, it does give you that opportunity to innovate and then share in the gain that you make between target and uh, target cost and outcome. And, uh, and I think that kind of mechanism, I could see that, uh, that being more widely used to, uh, to drive that innovation, drive that process efficiency, make sure that integration is, uh, is happening. And, um, and certainly, you know, in the business we had, which started as a partnership until we ended up buying it, you know, we've seen huge efficiency gains. Uh, it, it's predicated on the fact that a lot of what we do is repeatable. So, you know, if you're doing 50 village water supply schemes, you know, you can build quite, a, quite an efficient machine to uh, deliver that. But it still astounds me that, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, a good example is small pump stations at Anglin Water, where we've had um, a, an automated process based on a few parameters, which drives a BIM model that you then fine-tune. Uh, works fine in Anglia, but isn't acceptable to United Utilities. So even in the country, uh, within one country, we have people who are driving different specifications, different agendas. Surely a pump station is a pump station is a pump station. We ought to be able to use it around the world. Uh, but, um, you know, there you go. That's right. standardization for you. But, uh, but I think that's the, the trend will be towards that because it's going to be so much more efficient. If I can standardize, reuse, configure, um, that has to be, uh, got to be more efficient in the end of the day. Okay, I'm going to go to Laura now. You, you, one of your slides, you talk about people, people, people. Uh, and also, I pick up in Manish, you talked about this culture and how do you get that into the system. Um, we're now moving into business effectively into, well, which is what we've been advocating. It doesn't mean the rest of the world have to be there, but there may be different market is ready for that. How do we deal with the issue about IP, the intellectual property? that stick in the whole sort of collaborative approach. I mean, as I say, global company, where you've got creative, innovative ideas flowing from your people that you've invested time and energy into that. To perfect that, how do you harness and actually hold on to that uh, when you go into this collaborative approach or end-to-end -end solution with big clients? I think, um, I think just continuing the conversation about procurement yeah. models yeah. Um, and alternatives is a good example of where that collaboration could and should exist um, and I'm reminded of just uh, some recent conversations with some let's call them European clients where um, you know they're, they're referring to just contractual models of the last few years and they think that um, a lump sum sort of certainty is what they need to deliver their most important objectives around time and cost but by introducing some of those models, for example, from Australia, which are more collaborative forms of delivery, whether it's alliancing, um, I, I think tapping into that global network and, um, you know, even some of the approaches that have been used in the, the UK are interesting, but as a sort of procurement community, certainly within our organisation, I think there's a great opportunity to almost develop some hybrids that 
we can present to some of our clients that still address those very important KPIs that they have. But I, I'm saying, I mean, some clients are open to that and, and some are not. And if we look, but what the, on, the, on the positive side, um, we know even in the UK that the government is saying, bring you know, market proposals to us. Maybe we can share some of the frameworks, for example, around market-led proposals that are very robust and mature in places like Australia and bring them to places like the UK where there is you know, a shortage of funding for projects. So that's, that's a really live example within our organisation around procurement and there are people who are very skilled at working in these very different contracting models but I think that's a very timely one at the moment where there's lots of great best practice um, so we're only limited by our clients' openness to that to, to make that happen as an industry I think. Right, okay. I've got one more question to the panel. I'm going to open it up, so please do get ready. Uh, Manish, you, you used the word earlier on about technology is all about predicting and understanding the ecosystem that we are sort of operating. In other words, if we fail to engage and to understand the ecosystem, then technology tends to override. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit about that and what you mean by that? Uh, <clears throat> What, what I was trying to come to was that technology itself, by itself is not something that we should all focus on. It's the, the ecosystem that technology fits into, uh, the type of service that needs to be provided, uh, the codes and regulations, the clients. Uh, we heard our colleagues here talk about uh, you know, design build P3 value addition. That has a lot of technology in it. But how do that comply with the codes and regulations? How does a client who is never, you know, they don't know how to take a VR model and make it work. And in, in Florida, we had an unfortunate uh, crash. That was an innovative project. That, that accident's going to push back. Well, no client's going to be willing f to, to listen to Keith or others if they come saying, we've done this, and, you know, it's an innovative approach because it's all about liabilities. So I think, uh, you know, to make... To make it work, the whole ecosystem and the elements are complementary to each other. And if you strengthen and mature these elements, I think you will be able to. And advocacy is something that goes long ways to make it happen. Right. I'm, I'm looking around. Where is the hand raised? Who is, who's the first question? Megan? In the far end? In the far end, please. Can you give us a Megan? Yes. Thanks. Megan Motto from Australia. Um, I wanted to first of all congratulate FIDIC for the great diversity of the panel sitting in front of us today, um, albeit that I look around the room and it's probably not as well reflected in the rest of this room. But I wanted to ask all of you, a couple of you touched on diversity and inclusion as key drivers of productivity in your business and particularly in unleashing the sort of innovation thinking that we need to generate not only the best, in, best of world's practice in, in projects but also to attract the talent that we want yeah, un our unfair share of talent for the future. I'm wondering on that topic, and in particularly on the topic of women in the sector, whether or not uh, you have targets in your organisations in terms of where you're at now, understanding where your current levels are, where you'd like to be, and how you're going to get there. That's a very loaded question, Megan. I, I quite appropriate. Uh, just to try and sum up, where do you stand on the concept of diversity and inclusion? Do you have a specific policy in-house? Do you set a target? And where are you on that target? Have I summed it up, Megan? Absolutely. So, Manish, you kick-started that subject. What's your take on the subject? Do you know, <laughs> Megan, I'm your friend, so please uh, forgive me. <laughs> Don't forget that. Uh, you know, my, I have a daughter who's studying engineering, and I, I've had a lot of conversations with her. I'm not a big fan of quota. I'm not a big fan that somebody should be given a slot just because it meets a quota or a KPI so you can go to your shareholders. I do believe that we need to bring women in for the right reasons. They are more predictable, they are more dedicated, they bring a different thought process. And in, in my organization, we have a great diversity. But I've always opposed the quota system. I feel it should be based on talent. You should have resources to it's, it's, you know, diversity in cultures, for example. Diversity of, of thought is, is very important as well. So I think we, we get carried away, at least in the United States, by gender diversity or, or race. But to me, in order for diversity to succeed, it has to be inclusive, it has to be meaningful, and it has to be across the board. 
That's my opinion. Laura? $65 million question. Oh, gosh. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to give all panel members equal opportunity to have their say on the subject. This is, this is why. I mean, I could talk about The question about is very specific. Oh, she, no. wants she wants to know, where are you in yeah. your targets? Well, I'm going to be honest. So I'm a year into my, my new role in EMEA, but I worked very closely with, with Megan um, back in Australia. And I, I'll, the lesson from that was, and we were both um, members of the Consult Australia Champions of Change program, we had a target in the Australian New Zealand business of 50% um, women in senior executive. Now, board level, okay. we went from 12 to 46, but it took three years, and we only got there. You, have, you do have, my, my lesson is you do need to make some interventions in the talent pipeline by actually going out and recruiting um, very aggressively, because if you just wait for the pipeline and a lot of internal initiatives, it just doesn't happen fast enough, because, of course, women will for obvious reasons, drop out of that pipeline. I mean, it's great to see, you know, co-parenting co and, and sharing of, of the, the workload with respect to parenting in particular. Well, I've, I mean, just a personal reflection. I mean, being based in the UK, I, I don't yet, I've been a little bit disappointed. I haven't seen at an industry level quite the, um, what's called the desire that this okay. is important as a business priority and, and what are we doing about it? So we're, we're you know, just finalising some targets. I'm a big believer in targets. I'm not a believer in quotas. But if you don't have targets, you can't hold people accountable. You can't have something to aim for. And for me, it's got to be on the standard business agenda, just like profitability is, just like ethics and compliance is, just like health and safety is. I think it's a, it's a, it's a leadership issue, and it's, um, it's got to be part, embedded in your culture, and the leaders actually have to genuinely believe in why it's important. And subscribe to it. Yeah. And, yeah. What's your take on this yeah, subject? To, to end where, where, to start with where Laura uh, ended, yeah. uh, my strong belief is that everyone in the boardroom, uh, every CEO needs to really believe in the benefits. And for me to, you know, be an um, architecture and engineering company uh, without having a diverse um, um, organization, both in the boardroom, we are 50-50 in Sveco and in the top executive where we are 50-50, it's, it's, it's not relevant because you need to you know, mirror the, the society that, that you're going to design. So that is one thing and uh, you, you could actually, there is, is so much fact that you are more profitable, uh, but then you need to have as, as um, as said before, you have to have specific targets, but you also need to realize that it takes hard work because it's about uh, so many things when it comes to uh, if people are will, wanting, wanting to, to, you know, um, are attracted to a company, want to, to join, want to stay, want to develop and, and really, you know, develop. So you need to work in so many areas to succeed. Uh, and bringing in lots of efforts, as I said before. Okay, Keith, I did say I'm going to ask everybody, so we, I need to declare. I know where you are. Please tell the audience. What is yeah, so, this procedure? So we, 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 we tried to jive this from the top down a number of years ago when we weren't really succeeding. So in the end, we created space for people to drive it bottom up. So uh, we um, gave people time and, uh, and a budget to, 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 to build this from the bottom, from the enthusiasts, and particularly amongst our female staff and our younger staff and that seems to have worked in a spectacular fashion because rather than trying to drive something through a formal hierarchy we've driven it through an informal network. Um, all we've done as a board is given them time and space and money to do that. Uh, the master stroke was hiring somebody who is uh, a dedicated resource to, um, to, to push the thing along which, is, um, which has proved invaluable because uh, he has driven a whole range of um, initiatives, you know, from unconscious bias training across the board to uh, introducing um, separate promotions boards, which are, have, a, have a diverse um, panel to, to look at people who are up for promotion. We, we, we do set uh, targets, uh, so we have um, targets both on recruitment and promotion, and uh, uh, we, we, you know, we are, of course, governed by equal opportunities and uh, um, equal pay and things like that, so we monitor all of those uh, statistics, and we do, we do use them to influence the business. David? 
You want to take on the last that subject before we get to the next question? I will always go last. And, uh, <laughs> right, I started. Uh, oh, no, it's right. I did. I did. I tell a lie. Anyway, I'm, I'm still uh, enjoying the box thing that you brought around here. That was quite an Look, let's be honest, this is a long, long way from being fixed as, as an issue, apart from the fact that it is absolutely out there as a discussion point everywhere. Uh, we are miles away from being where we want to be. Right? Our, our Steve Dimitri, our, our chief exec, is absolutely on the case uh, from the top. He's pointing how do you drive that. We need to drive it right through our organisation, top to bottom. What, what I would say is, and... Uh, I, we, we do have targets internally, but we don't publish them because we, we will hold ourselves to account. And there's a reason for that. One of the things that I worry about, and, and we are making some interventions, and I never want a woman to be in a place where she thinks she's part of a quota. Right? Inclusion and diversity is about finding the best people we can find, and give them the best opportunities, apply themselves in everything we do, now, at a point where we do have maybe two candidates who are exactly the same, equally capable, equally enthusiastic, all of these good things, if it's a man and a woman, we will take the woman. Point taken. Can I go to the next that, question? So that's okay. That's it. Uh, so so the, there, is a, there is an intervention there, but I would hate to think any woman thinks they were in a role purely because they're part of a quota. That's completely unfair. Okay, thanks, David. That's well taken. Can I go yeah. to the question in five, five minutes, please? Five minutes left, then, Can I just suggest, please, you know, keep the question straight down because we, oh, yeah. we've run to try and maximise the time, please. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, ben Novak from Canada. Um, I have a question. Uh, well, uh, Ms. Poloni addressed the issue of uh, finding staff and so on. So I have a question on ownership in a public company. Um, as I know, uh, you represent a publicly held company. Would you think that? Uh, ownership by staff is a, an encouragement to join the company. Is it something that you can use in recruiting? And is it a good idea? Okay. Two-part question. <laughs> Thank you. It depends when. <laughs> um, so I think your question is, is, is ownership in a company like ours, which is New York Stock Exchange listed, at generally a good thing? I mean, I mean, it's up to the individual, but we do, I mean, you can buy you can buy and share trades in the open um, market. We certainly make the opportunity to have a stake in the company well known. But I mean, it's a pretty low-key sort of approach beyond that. I mean, it's it's really up to the up to the individual. I would say it's not something that we make a big make a big deal out of. Gavin, yeah. yes, please. And I've got one question coming to find yeah. Gavin, please. Yeah. Thank you to the panel. I thought that was um, it was very insightful and very open. So thanks for your presentations. And they were sli all slightly different, which I thought was great. But um, two things. I'd just like to make a comment first. I joined the I'm Gavin English. I'm an executive committee member. I joined the executive committee last year, and I was delighted to see a woman on the board, Aisha. But I still think we have an awful lot to do um, throughout FIDIC and throughout the member associations, but that's just a comment on the side. What I really want to ask you is, you've talked a lot about technology-driven, interconnected infrastructure systems. Um, these types of systems are increasingly susceptible to cyber attacks. And I'd just like the panel's view on what they think about that issue, how it's going to develop, and how we try to mitigate that risk going forward. OK. Um, who fans is taking that? Manish, do you have a view on it? Uh, <clears throat> cyber security is, is definitely a big, big topic and uh, in the United States it's becoming very critical because you talk about different offices working, working for a client. So for the, for the work we do for DOD, it's a very defined platform that we have to work on. I can't talk much about it mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. <laughs> Can we take one more question? I, I can see Greg, she's telling me time is out. I've got one more question. <laughs> Sorry, on this side. Can we keep it brief, please, you know, because I need to sum up. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'll just hold it for Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, panel. Michel Kahn from France, CETEC. Okay. Um, I have the impression that we had the advice or the, uh, the comments of a panel made of large companies engineering companies. Now, on the other side, you have all these new ecosystems of <laughs> startups. And from a personal point of view, I have, have had very various uh, 
experience with these startups. Some of them are very nice people, very different from us, very young, very innovative, and some of them are don't, just don't talk the same language as we do. They want to burn cash, they want, you know. So I would be interested in how you deal with this new ecosystem and how do you input that into your development of new technologies? Right. Want to take it? Axel, please. Yeah. First of all, uh, we represent big companies, but we also, I need to, to address that Sveco has 70,000 projects uh, ongoing in Europe, and the, and the average project is ac actually uh, around 25,000 euro. So we actually have a very local small projects where we compete with small companies. But I think it's, uh, it's about um, taking um, you know, that kind of knowledge on board, interact with them, and as Laura said, the partnership in different forms is something that is really important. And it's also, um, what I can see is that development, um, when it comes to how we have invested in IT, goes for all areas. And it's also about lots of development when it comes to IT competence in, in our teams, but also IT competence in the, in the traditional um, engineering and architectural competence. Um, right. Just to try and wrap up, I'm going to go start from David. What would be your word of wisdom uh, you know, to the audience? Um, understanding the question is being raised earlier and that the panel has been selected from large firm, which is not strictly true because managed company is actually a relatively small company. I think the panel has been selected from companies who are operating on a global basis, so it's two representation. What would be one sentence that you want to leave the audience with on the subject? Uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get the cyber security question. Uh, I, I, think, I think my overarching uh, comment would be about the youth and talent of tomorrow. I, I think we are, are blocking far too much of that talent. There's far too many grey hairs in a lot of our organisations and we need to let it free. And your, your point there about you know, entrepreneurial spirit, I used to be quite entrepreneurial when I was young, right? struggle with it now in a big firm. So let, let our young talent come through and they will make a massive difference. Okay, thank you. Keith? I would say wake up and recognise that things out there are changing faster than we are changing as an industry. And if we don't get our heads around that, then uh, we won't be the same industry. Axel, your view? One sentence? Um, as I started out, uh, to really put all our effort into to all the solutions and drive uh, this industry to really support around the, the, the problems around the climate change. And uh, uh, said before, really, you know, change and develop uh, to the future. Thank you. Uh, for me, I think partnerships are key and they apply to us as an industry tackling um, you know, diversity and inclusion, our next wave of competitiveness, all sorts of um, factors around that. Okay. Manish? I, I think we should not forget why we became engineers. I think uh, that uh, we, we get carried away with reading all these things, going to conferences, but I, to me the role of an engineer I mean, is to be a steward to ensure the infrastructure is well built in safe and overall good for the public. Uh, and in the whole picture thing, I think we need, we have a responsibility as leaders to, to advocate, to do advocacy, not only for our politicians and our clients, but also to encourage going in high schools or middle school level and showing the field of engineering, the importance of it. And I think in the United States, the enrollment is down. And that's a worrisome thing. Right, okay. Mindful that Greg is sitting there, just reading the wrap up. We did this survey when we started. I think the two key messages that came for me was people and the issue about profitability. How do you balance that issue? And that impacts on what we do, how we do, and what we actually, where we get engaged. I get distinct impression that the message is that the world is changing, that we need to change within, the ecosystem that we're operating in. Uh, some of the issues that were spoken about were quite critical about people. Uh, about partnership, about collaboration, and actually looking at our business model to make sure we fit the future. Diversity was touched about, predominantly from a female point of view, but there is issue diversity and inclusion, which cover other ethnic minorities, which are other issues, and that all should be, we should address that across our industry. 
Uh, there are good practices. I can tell you some of the MAs are doing fantastic job on issues to do with reverse mentoring, which I think, you know, in the case of David, you raised that issue about past the age of 52. It's a bit of a challenge to deal with technology. Uh, there is reverse mentoring, which is get a young one to teach you how to do technology. And vis a vis, you can tell them how to run business. So those models are out there. I just want to wrap up by saying, would you join me in saying a massive thank you to this panel for actually sharing the experience. <laughs> Mr. MC, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nelson. Thank you once again to our um, excellent panel joining us here on stage. Also Bergman, uh, Manish Kothari, Lara Poloni, Keith Howells and David Reed, ably managed and moderated by Nelson Ogunshaken. It brings to a close our first of our panels. This was Perspectives from the Boardroom. And from this point, we have an opportunity to head across into our networking lunch. Please do take the opportunity to meet someone new. Don't stay with your own colleagues and friends. Look across the room, find somebody new, and make that connection. Those relationships to be built here will propel us into the future. Um, we'll be back at 1.30 p.m., ladies and gents. 1.30 p.m., ready, raring to go, as we move into the next of our uh, presentations. And we're joined here on the stage with two fabulous yeah. presenters, Greg Bentley and Javier Baldor. Thanks, ladies and gents. See you soon. Yeah. Yeah,